You're watching the station that works for you. Now, ABC2 News at 11. Welcome into ABC2 News at 11. I'm Kelly Swoop alongside Jamie Costello. I'm thankful that you are because we've got a fog advisory on mm -hmm. your Friday night. I wouldn't be able to see you. I no can't kidding. make meteorologist Mike Taylor out. Thank goodness for a double box. <laughs> oh, we don't have one tonight. Son of a gun. Well, see, I can't see. That's the thing. You can't see. It's that fog. Yeah, we have the dense fog advisory in place. The atmosphere is completely saturated. We have a warm front pushing in. Key word there, warm front. It's going to warm us up for the weekend. But in the meantime, we'll be dealing with the fog and also the showers passing through as well. So 43 degrees right now. The winds are calm and you have the dew point and the temperature pretty close together. And that's what produces a good recipe for some fog. So this dense fog advisory is mainly west of the bay, but I have a feeling it could expand across the eastern shore. Therefore, it's not including the eastern shore. But once again, some changes will be on the horizon. Looking at our Futurecast visibility product here it does keep the mostly cloudy, murky conditions around all the way into tomorrow morning. So thank goodness we don't have a rush hour, but it could still slow you down in the morning and temperatures will slowly begin to climb. Coming up in the full forecast, we'll talk more about some warmer days ahead and we'll address those rain chances as well. All right, Mike, thank you. Here we are more than a week after 17 people were killed at a high school in Parkland, Florida. We're now hearing more about what happened that tragic day from the people who saw the shooting unfold. And we're also learning more about the events leading up to the shooting, even hearing what appears to be the shooting suspect on a call just months earlier. ABC's Maggie Rui has the latest. Authorities are releasing new details about what happened in the months leading up to last week's school shooting, including a full transcript of the tip the FBI received a month before the shooting. In the call, a female warns that the alleged shooter was going to explode, saying he would threaten to kill people on social media. She claims she told the Parkland Police Department and was telling the FBI just in case he, quote, starts shooting places up. The FBI has admitted to failing to follow up on the tip and sharing it with the Bureau's FBI field office. Also released, a 911 one call from someone who appears to be the alleged shooter about three months before the shooting happened. The thing is, I lost my mother a couple of weeks ago, so like I'm dealing with a budget thing right now. The Broward County Sheriff's Office says they were called to the alleged shooter's former Parkland home 23 times. Two of those calls were directly related to concerns that this person could potentially shoot up a school. <laughs> Students across the country are standing behind Stoneman Douglas. And many met with top government officials this week, including Florida Governor Rick Scott. My message to them has been very simple. You are not alone. Today, Scott announced a new action plan that puts nearly $500 million towards a school safety program. The students and their families will be back on campus for an orientation this Sunday to start what the superintendent says is a week of transition for the students, getting them back together to try to find some level of normalcy. Maggie Ruley, ABC News, New York. And we've seen a lot of this lately. Fake threats of school violence have surged since that mass shooting in South Florida. Now a pair of students facing charges here accused of making a real threat at Edgewood High School in Hartford County. Police say that 18-year-old Shanae Evans and Alexis Robinson scribbled a threat about shooting up the school on a desk, took a photo of it, and circulated it among the classmates. The teens are now charged with a series of crimes, including making a threat of mass violence, which carries a penalty of up to 10 years in prison. Well, today the state of Maryland said goodbye to a second police officer killed in the line of duty in just three months' time. Prince George's County Corporal Mujahideen Ramzadin was laid to rest today at a traditional Muslim funeral in Lanham. The corporal was shot and killed on Wednesday when he ran to help a neighbor struggling with a domestic violence incident. Friends, family, and really complete strangers turned out for the brief funeral today. His eldest son spoke about his father's last act as an officer, saying that today he is a hero. Without hesitation, my dad went out there to assist that, that young lady. He didn't know that you know, he was going to get shot five times. You know, he protected that, that lady and uh, it cost him his life. So today, today, today my dad is a hero. Today, today, my dad's a hero. Ramsden is survived by four children and his wife. He was buried in a private ceremony at Fort Lincoln Cemetery in Brentwood. The couple behind that so-called torture house in California is facing more charges tonight. After a hearing today, prosecutors say David and Louise Turpin are facing three additional counts of child abuse. 
and an additional felony assault against Louise. The Turpins are accused of starving and torturing their 13 children. Authorities say the husband and wife held the children captive for years, even though seven of them are, seven of them are legal adults. The Turpins have pleaded not guilty to all the accounts. Their next court date is set for March 23rd. A judge delayed the trial for a Maryland man accused of killing his pregnant girlfriend. Tyler Tessier is charged in the death of Laura Wallen. In court today, audio from a jail phone call between Tessier and his father was played. In it, the two spoke about how going slow on the trial is everyone's advantage right now. Tessier's trial is now set for September 4th. New tonight at 11 o'clock, the flu has killed 13 more children, bringing the season now to 97 deaths for our children. And the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention says it's the worst flu season in a decade, and it's still not over. A spokesperson for the CDC says more than half of the country is still reporting high levels of activity, and flu season could last until mid-April. The CDC points out that most of the children who have died this year have not been vaccinated. And then we have a warning tonight about vaping. A new study out of Hopkins says they have potentially unsafe levels of toxic chemicals. The university tested e-liquids and vapors refilling dispensers from 56 Baltimore area daily e-cig users. And they found the presence of 15 metals. And in the 10 samples, researchers found significant levels of highly toxic arsenic. And the Johns Hopkins team is now planning future studies and says more research must be done to determine possible health effects. Well, we had some big names out for an important cause in Baltimore tonight. Yeah, it's the 14th annual Aspire Gala brought in millions for youth athletic clubs all across the country. And ABC 2's Eddie Kadem was at the event tonight. Everybody's familiar with the name Ripken, but they might not know how much the Cal Ripken Senior Foundation is helping out. Eddie will tell us. Yeah, that's right, Jamie. Since 2009, the foundation has built 75 parks across the country. That's allowed over 460,000 inner city kids to play ball on state of the art fields. Cal Ripken Jr., Jonathan Ogden, Gary Williams. There were some big names honored at the Cal Ripken Senior Foundation Aspire Gala. But the cause is for the little people with big futures. We're really not trying to teach or send players to the major leagues. We're really just trying to teach and uh, kids to be just uh, community leaders, uh, uh, educators, or just be a positive role model within the community. The foundation helped build a brand new state-of-the-art turf field for more than 300 kids in West Baltimore. It builds their confidence. You know, in order to reach one, you must teach one. You know, James Mosier has built that program from the ground up, but to have these partners come in, like the Cal Ripken Senior Foundation, and just to recognize a program that's been in existence for over 59 years, one of the oldest African-American low league programs in the country. Through the Badges for Baseball organization, police and youth come together through sport. Kids and cops working together through the Ripken Foundation to make the right choices. And uh, Cal Sr. emulated that in his baseball players about uh, hard work on and off the field. We match up police officers with these kids, and they play ball. And they, the police officer mentors and coaches the kids instead of the alternative that we see way too often. Millions of dollars raised and thousands of young lives changed. Cutting the ribbon is wonderful and it's exhilarating, but then you come back a couple days later and you see the programming taking place and it's even better. This was a record breaking night. Four million dollars raised. Four million dollars. More ballparks. Yeah, more parks like the one in West Baltimore. Yeah, they've built 75 so far and they're hoping by this time next year to have a hundred built and these cost about a million dollars a piece. So they're going to have about $100 million invested in these parks across the country. It's a great program. Nothing upsets Cal more than seeing a backstop empty. He yeah. wants kids on that field. Well, kids on the field. Thanks, Eddie. They're making it happen. All right. Thanks a lot. Hey, there's a place down in Annapolis that's full of history and serving up second chances. We're going to find out why. The Lighthouse Bistro is too good to be true. And the thought of putting a record on might bring back some memories. Tonight, how vinyl is making a comeback. You're watching ABC2 News at 11.
A pharmacy used to sit at 202 West Street in Annapolis, then a homeless shelter took over the corner. And now it's a beacon for second chances, a restaurant serving up second helpings of help. Tonight, the Lighthouse Bistro is too good to be true. Our specials today are a shrimp salad that will be served on a multi grain croissant. Now that you know the specials, Beth will show you to your table to hear the story of how the bistro came to be. I was homeless about two years ago. And now Rich is tossing that chicken salad on today's special. I was lost. I had no meaning for life. Just run in the streets. Our bottom line is, is jobs, not profit. Our bottom line is jobs. Everybody you see working the bistro was or still is homeless. They came into the lighthouse shelter, which sits two miles away, and for 16 weeks, they learned how to work in a restaurant. The mission is so good that the Harry and Jeanette Weinberg Foundation is backing this place. Being here, I've built up a resume of a lot of different things, you know, barista, hosting, serving. And for diners, they have no idea the story behind this place, but jaws drop when they find out not only the fact that it's a great restaurant, but it's a great mission. The way they take homeless people, train them in the culinary arts, and give them a job. And just to be clear, this isn't a soup kitchen. No, this is a full-fledged restaurant handing out futures for dessert. I'm actually hoping to go to school to be a substance abuse counselor and kind of work in the field of homelessness. I just want to keep moving forward. We want you to come here because you know you're going to get a great meal and great service and then find out that you know what, you're absolutely giving somebody a second chance. The Lighthouse Bistro in Annapolis. You are too good to be true. What a great story. I tell you, yeah. So what about the check? The check. Once the check comes, you pay the bill, you leave a tip, it goes to fight homelessness. How about that? Uh, and talk about reclaiming lives. The entire restaurant is recycled. I mean, the chairs in there uh -huh. are from the 1950s. Plebes used to sit the, at them at the Naval Academy. There's a, there's a bench in there from St. Anne's Church 300 years ago. Everything. It's just an incredible, incredible. It's a great idea. Definitely not, not a soup kitchen. I mean, it's, it's a, it looks a fancy place. It is great. And it's given homeless people a chance at a job and they'll they'll leave there and go somewhere else. Great that story. Something? Excellent good. story. All right, it was a big night for the Good Morning Maryland team along with some other folks here at ABC2. That's right. They took on Channel 13 during the halftime show at the Baltimore Blast game tonight. And ABC2 started out hot with Skylar Henry scoring the first goal. They came back 